வணக்கம் we are going to come across radial nerve injuries at some point in our career and it is important to understand these injuries and when there is an injury we need to find the level at which the injury has occurred and to do this we need to do a thorough clinical examination we all know about the classical drop of the wrist thumb and fingers that occurs in a radial nerve palsy but how do we individually assess the different muscles supplied by the radial nerve the second segment gives a demonstration of the clinical examination in a case of radial nerve palsy the second section of the basics of radial nerve deals with the clinical examination of radial nerve function the aims of clinical examination are to clinically assess the radial nerve palsy by identifying the level or site of the injury to assess recovery if present and to identify donors for transfer as in all clinical examination we shall start with the history then the inspection palpation motor examination sensory examination and in case of radial nerve injury we shall be dealing with the examination of donor muscles apart from the <clears throat> in the history apart from the general factors such as the age sex of the patient occupation of the patient and handedness of the patient we should note the duration time of injury the type of injury whether it has been a crush sharp injury avulsion injury blunt injury or even a needle prick because even needle prick injuries can cause radial nerve palsy at the same time other injuries like the fracture of the humerus should be ruled out if there has been a fracture of the humerus we need to find out whether the patient noticed any weakness of the fingers at the time of injury and what was the treatment that was given for the fracture humerus and when did the patient note the deficit in his hand as far as the radial nerve injury is concerned we need to examine two things the attitude of the limb and the presence of a wound or surgical or traumatic scars these clinical pictures show the typical example of the post traumatic scar on the lateral aspect of the middle of the arm and the typical position of the hand that is wrist drop thumb drop and finger drop this clinical picture shows a very innocent looking wound on the lateral aspect of the middle of the arm with a typical wrist drop thumb drop and finger drop though the wound looked very small because of the clinical findings of radial nerve palsy exploration was done and it revealed an injury a total transection of the radial nerve at the level of the spiral groove in this clinical example there is a telltale scar on the posterior aspect of the entire length of the arm and the x-ray shows the fixation of the fracture of the middle of shaft of humerus with a plate and screws in a case of radial nerve injury the role of palpation is for three particular points the first is eliciting the tunnel sign the second is eliciting the passive range of movement of the involved joints and third is two point discrimination and sums vein steam testing please click on the icon shown above to see more about the sensory examination of nerves in the motor examination we need to test every single muscle that is supplied by radial nerve when testing the triceps muscle the elbow extension must always be tested against gravity as shown here when testing the power of the triceps muscle one hand of the examiner supports the forearm and offers resistance against extension of the elbow and the other hand supports the elbow joint and palpates the triceps muscle contraction testing the brachialis is also simple elbow flexion is tested with the forearm kept in total pronated position and the patient is asked to flex the elbow it is the brachialis that works here the main nerve supply to the brachialis is from the musculocutaneous nerve and has a root value of c56 but when the radial nerve branch supplies the brachialis it has a root value of c7 in testing the brachioradialis an important point again elbow flexion must be tested with the forearm in mid prone position now it is being demonstrated on the normal side 
and the patient is asked to perform the flexion, you can palpate and even see the brachioradial muscle getting prominent. The anconeus muscle is a small muscle that originates from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and inserts distally on the superior posterior surface of the ulna and the lateral aspect of the olecranon. It acts almost as an extension of the triceps and stabilizes the joint capsule when full extension of the elbow is performed. When full extension of the elbow is done, it can be palpated on the radial side of the palpable subcutaneous portion of the ulna. Testing the supinator, we must remember that the biceps must be kept elongated, that is the elbow must be kept extended. The patient is asked to forcefully supinate the forearm against resistance. The other method in which the supinator muscle can be tested is to make the patient lie supine, shoulder flexed to 90 degrees, elbow flexed maximum and forearm kept in mid prone position. From this position, the patient is asked to do supination against resistance. In this position, the action of the biceps is also negated because it is completely relaxed and cannot act. When the patient does supination against resistance, the supinator muscle can be palpated on the radial side of the proximal third of the forearm just radial to the palpable subcutaneous border of the ulna. To test the extensor carpi radialis brevis and extensor carpi radialis longus, the patient is asked to extend the wrist. When this extension occurs, it must occur in a line of the forearm. If there is a deviation to the radial side, it could mean either that the extensor carpi ulnaris is not acting or the extensor carpi radialis brevis which is the more central extensor of the wrist is not acting. And if when the patient extends the wrist, it deviates to the ulnar side, it means that the extensor carpi radialis longus and the brevis are not acting. To test the extensor digitorum communis of the fingers, the hand must be placed flat on the examining surface and the patient must be asked to extend the fingers one by one off from the table. To test the extensor digiti minimi, the patient is asked to make a closed fist and extend only the little finger. To test the extensor indices proprius, the patient is asked to make a closed fist and then extend only the index finger. When testing for the extensor carpi ulnaris, it is not only important to ask the patient to extend the wrist, but we should also palpate the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle, extensor carpi ulnaris tendon as it becomes tense. The extensor pollicis longus is tested by supporting the proximal phalangeal region of the thumb and asking the patient to extend the interphalangeal joint. At the same time, Resistance should be offered to the terminal phalangeal region to test the power of the extensor pollicis longus. To test the extensor pollicis brevis, the patient is asked to extend the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb and resistance is offered against the dorsal aspect of the proximal phalangeal region of the thumb. When the abductor pollicis longus is tested, patient is asked is, is asked to keep the hand flat on the table and abduct the thumb at the carpometacarpal phalangeal at the carpometacarpal joint. Resistance can be offered at the level of the metacarpal region to test the power of the muscle. The sensory examination of the radial nerve is done by testing the sensation along the posterior cutaneous nerve of the arm territory, the lower lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the superficial branch of the radial nerve as shown in the diagram. In examination of radial nerve palsy, we also need to test the donor muscles in case we need to do a tendon transfer. The commonly used donor muscles are the pronata teres, the flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus and the flexor digitum superficialis of the middle and ring fingers. For testing the action and the power of the pronata teres, the patient is usually seated and one of the hands of the examiner supports the elbow and the other hand holds the wrist and forearm in a position of total supination. 
the patient is asked to forcefully pronate the forearm against the resistance offered by the examiner's hand. And while this action is being done, the pronator teres can also be palpated under the lateral aspect of the proximal half of the forearm. To test the flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor carpi radialis, the patient is asked to flex the wrist against resistance. And while this is being done, the flexor carpi radialis and the flexor carpi ulnaris tendons can be palpated. To test the palmaris longus muscle, the patient is asked to oppose the little finger and the thumb and then flex the wrist against resistance. The palmaris longus tendon can be seen to stand out as a strand under the skin. Finally, to test the flexor digitorum superficialis of the middle and ring fingers, when the middle finger is being tested, the index, ring and little fingers are restrained and the patient is asked to flex the middle finger. When he does this, we must note flexion at the proximal interpharyngeal joint. At the same time, we need to palpate the tone of the distal interpharyngeal joint. If it is the flexor digitorum superficialis that is acting, the distal interpharyngeal joint will be lax. Similarly, the flexor digitorum superficialis of the ring finger is also tested. Having learnt about the clinical examination of the function of the radial nerve, we shall now see a few examples of clinical findings at different levels of radial nerve injury. Let us first see the example of a patient who has sustained an injury at the level of the spiral groove. This patient had sustained a fracture of the mid shaft of the humerus and plate and screw fixation had been done through the posterior approach. When this patient has a radial nerve palsy, it is obviously an injury at the level of the spiral groove. In such injuries, there is a total palsy of the wrist extensors, thumb extensors and finger extensors. When there is an injury to the radial nerve at the level of the proximal posterior interosseous nerve, as happened in this patient who had a dislocation of the radial head, the extension of the wrist is preserved because the branches to the extensor carpi radial is longus and brevis are given away before the posterior interosseous nerve has formed. But there is a loss of extension of the fingers and thumb as obvious in this patient. But when the injury to the posterior interosseous nerve is more distal as in this patient who had an injury by a glass piece. In fact, we can see one of the remnants of the glass pieces in the x-ray had extension of the wrist, extension of the extensor indices proprius and extensor digite minimi and all the thumb extensors that is the extensor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus. So it was a very selective injury of the posterior interosseous nerve at the level of the middle of the forearm. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. To see more about the basics of radial nerve and the different types and techniques of repair, please click on the shown links. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery.